Okay, there's a lull. I'm gonna call it good. Hey. <laughs> okay, um, hi everybody. I'm Carla Girardi Lowe uh, with Redwood Heights Association and I'm gonna uh, do two things, letting people in and talk. Um, so thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, I'm super excited to have um, Doug Mosher with Oakland um, Fire Safe Council. Uh, join us tonight uh, to talk about how we prepare for disaster. Um, since we have a few risks in our area, um, it's a, a super relevant topic. Um, so a couple things, um, we are recording this. Um, so, and it should be recording, yes. Uh, and, um, and then Doug's gonna talk about his agenda, but if you have questions, please put them in the chat. And then if we aren't able to answer them, uh, we will download all the questions and, and then we can um, respond to you via email. Um, okay, and all right. So I'm like I said, I'm Carla Girardi Lowe with Redwood Heights Association. I'm the president of the association and we're super excited that we're able to bring um, so many of these great um, events to the community as we've had to pivot to this you know, digital world online, um, but we're hoping that we'll be able to um, catch up with you all very soon in person. I hear we came, went into the red today, so that's good. Um, so, you know, we certainly appreciate everybody's support and we're so glad to see so many community members, even though we can't see you in person. Um, and so, you know, you can always support our work um, at, you know, through our website, you know, making a donation, it's uh, rhaoakland.org. And then also um, the firesafecouncil.org is where um, Doug uh, is with that group. And they're, you know, really trying to find ways to, to help protect our communities from, um, from wildfires. So, okay, with that, um, I'm gonna turn over this presentation to Doug so we can, um, get going and see if you can hear what you're here to hear. Um, again, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. All right, Doug, all yours. Thank you, Carla. Uh, great to see everyone here on a, on a thankfully rainy evening. Um, it's, it's good, I, I'm, I'm liking the rain coming down. So uh, just before I get started, I dropped some links into the chat. These are links that will be in the presentation I'll be uh, providing for the next hour. And um, I will also make uh, a copy of the presentation available to Carla afterwards, and she can get that out to you. So don't feel like you have to uh, write anything down as I'm talking because uh, I am going to be talking for uh, about the next hour. I will do my best to, to deliver this workshop on preparedness and response uh, in an hour's time frame. So that means I kind of have to talk all the way through. And if we can, we'll hold questions as Carla noted to the end. Uh, but if you have questions, again, please jot them down in the chat and then we will uh, address those at the end. So I'm uh, free to stay as long as anyone wants to stay after this presentation. So let's get started. Okay, so the topic tonight, of course, is preparedness, uh, the path to safety. And the program that I'm going to be talking about uh, and that is, uh, has created this workshop and other information is called the Oakland Community Preparedness and Response Program. It's a mouthful. So we call it OCPNR, Oakland Preparedness uh, and Response. And what is OCPNR? So I'm gonna spend a few minutes just covering that before getting into the, the nuts and bolts of preparedness uh, and response. So OCPNR is a community program uh, of the Oakland Fire Safe Council. You can check out our website. Uh, the Fire Safe Council is a nonprofit. Um, it actually covers more than just Oakland, it covers Alameda County. The Fire Safe Council uh, is made up of volunteers um, and it is tasked with helping um, our community be more fire safe, be more disaster safe. Uh, the Fire Safe Council works on vegetation management issues. Um, so a lot of different aspects of, uh, 
you know, helping the community to be better prepared for disaster. So please check out the website. Uh, and at the end, I'm going to talk about a, a series of um, uh, sessions that we are holding, Zoom sessions as well, one coming up in a couple of weeks uh, on uh, vegetation management, the next one. So again, it's a community program to provide education in the form of workshops, materials, and support to increase disaster preparedness and improve disaster response capabilities for all of Oakland. So OCPNR is an education program for disaster preparedness and response. We, the Fire Safe Council, uh, obtained a grant from CAL FIRE and California Fire Foundation back in 2019 to put this program together. And if anyone's wondering if, if folks have gone through CORE or are familiar with CORE, communities of Oakland respond to emergency emergencies, it very much, OCPNR very much complements CORE and now the new CERT training. And I'll cover those um, topics in a bit as well. So what do we cover? Well, OCPNR, are, it was designed to really um, promote the top actions that people should take to prepare, be prepared for and be able to respond to a disaster such as an earthquake or a wildfire. So you can think of it again as, as the top 10, if you will. Things you need to do. We start with organized neighborhoods. We feel that's, that's key to uh, not only preparedness, but a lot of other uh, advantages of being organized into a neighborhood group. Uh, and you can read the rest of these. And I'm gonna go through these in this, in this workshop again at a high level because it's only an hour, but we have all this information online. So if you go to our website, uh, and, and I really encourage you to do so afterwards, and take a look at what we have. So we have uh, information, including uh, detailed guides. We have 22 different guides. I'll explain more about those in a minute. We actually have short videos on our website. We have checklists. So it's a lot of information that you can uh, take a look at um, to help you become better prepared. We also created a, a two-way emergency radio network called Gen Oak, and I'm not gonna talk about that tonight, but if you're interested in it, uh, there is the website. Uh, and we have a lot of folks in Oakland that are participating in, in this network to uh, connect neighborhoods, neighborhood groups so that people can communicate with each other uh, during and after disaster. So that's what we do cover. And what don't we cover? Well, we don't cover um, incident command system, which is used by FEMA and CERT, where you have team leaders, logistics planning, and so on. We don't cover disaster first aid, medical operations, uh, psychology, fire suppression. We don't cover search and rescue, terrorism, and security. So um, those uh, topics and more are now covered uh, in Oakland's new CERT training program. So CERT is Community Emergency Response Team. It's the national FEMA program for um, disaster preparedness training. It supersedes uh, CORE. And there is the URL, and that's also in the chat that you can go to, to get more information on CERT and to sign up for CERT classes, which are going to be offered uh, this year. They're actually just uh, going on right now. The next one probably in June. So that's what we don't cover. And just a quick uh, overview. We've worked with a lot of uh, different agencies in putting OCPNR together. We pulled from a lot of different sources. We had a lot of uh, folks review our materials from uh, the fire department, from the former core group. Um, and so we didn't do this in a vacuum. And obviously there's a lot of information out there, not just uh, CERT, uh, of course, not just CPNR, there's ready.gov. There, there are a lot of different sources of information out there. So we really tried to pull the best from uh, a, a, lot of different, um, a lot of different agencies and a lot of different subject matter uh, experts. So tonight, the focus of this workshop is going to be why we need to prepare, uh, spend a little time on that, and then how to prepare both at home and in your, in your neighborhood. Uh, how best to respond to a disaster, emergency, 
and then how best to recover. Uh, and then finally, at the end, we're going to uh, suggest some actions that um, you all should take afterwards. So the flow of this workshop, and this is pretty standard, uh, standard stuff for disaster response, preparedness and response, you organize and prepare before an, an emergency. And everybody probably goes, well, duh. But uh, you, you don't want to try to obviously prepare during an emergency. It's not going to do you any good. So you really need to do the work beforehand, uh, and that's now. Uh, and then during an emergency, of course, you respond, and after emergency, you recover. So again, pretty standard stuff. Um, and we will go through each of these uh, sections right now, starting with why do we need to be prepared? Well, if you look at Oakland, uh, you'll see that there are two uh, fire zones. I'm talking about fire first defined by CAL FIRE and, and Office of Emergency Services. The red is the very high fire hazard severity zone, and the yellow is the high fire hazard severity zone. And I'm pretty sure that your group is uh, either in the red or the yellow, probably more on the red side. I don't have the map as detailed as it could be, but uh, suffice to say that uh, we are all in either that high or very high fire hazard severity zone. And we're actually, this zone is actually ranked seventh in California. And that's not a ranking you wanna be at the top of. That means uh, we're in the top 10 of uh, wildfire hazard zones uh, for a variety of different reasons. And we know that we have the Hayward Fault. So not only wildfire, but we have that earthquake threat. So the approximate location of the Hayward Fault, we know that it it pretty much runs down highways 13 and 580. Uh, and we know that uh, over the last mm, 700 years, the Hayward Fault has had a major quake about every 140 years. This has been pretty well researched. <clears throat> and it's now been 153 years since the last big quake on the Hayward Fault. So we know, statistically speaking, we are overdue for a major earthquake. Not only uh, wildfire and earthquake, but we have also other potential threats, uh, disasters, emergencies. We have the Port of Oakland. Uh, something could happen there. We have the, the threats of tsunami, in, uh, certainly in, in certain sections of Oakland. Uh, so, but for most of us, earthquake and wildfire are the two biggest uh, disasters that we need to be as best prepared for as we can be. I want to make this point also that uh, one of the reasons that we need to be prepared is that we will respond first, we being residents. So we need to be able to take care of ourselves, our families, and our neighbors for up to several days because there are a lot more residents of Oakland than there are police and firefighters and emergency responders. And they, in a major disaster, will likely be engaged elsewhere. So, you know, responding to an emergency effectively means that we need to be prepared. Now, saying that we respond first, that's not to say that most of us are first responder professionals. So you need to understand that and understand the limitations of that. And for example, don't go rushing into a burning building unless you've had the training to do so. Okay, so this first section on preparing before an emergency. Again, that's the time to prepare, right? We wanna be organized and we wanna be ready. Uh, being organized has a lot of different advantages. And when, when I say organized, I mean in, in what we call an organized neighborhood group. I know you have a, um, you know, a, an association Redwood Heights, uh, and I'm hoping that you have in that association, you have you know, various uh, groups or blocks that are organized with a block captain or, or a block leader. Um, sometimes these are called block by block groups or neighborhood action teams, whatever. But the idea is you're, you're organized into uh, a certain number of homes. Uh, and why? Well, a lot of reasons why. First and foremost, uh, by being organized, <laughs> you know, neighbors tend to know each other better. 
and you're building uh, what you might call a trusted support network. You know, neighbors are going to help you. You're going to help neighbors in the event of a disaster. You can prepare for uh, and you know respond to an emergency together. Strength in numbers. Uh, you can create a safer area as well in an organized neighborhood group. Uh, you become neighborhood watch trained to help uh, reduce crime. You can work on neighborhood beautification. Uh, a lot of different things you can do if you're, you know, again, more of an organized uh, neighborhood group and building more of a connected community. Oh yeah, uh, parking and traffic concerns as well. Uh, in some sections of Oakland, uh, narrow streets can cause uh, major issues during a disaster. So how to organize your neighborhood if you aren't already, uh, your neighborhood group isn't already well organized. Uh, it's a pretty simple uh, process. You form a startup team. That could be one or two people, usually it is. You identify um, you know, the boundaries, how big is your group gonna be, how many homes, how many streets. You might wanna create a, a sort of a map so people can get a visual on that. And then you meet your neighbors. Well, we used to do that with social events. We're not doing that now, but you can still do this over Zoom or even conference calls with your neighbors. You typically wanna build a roster uh, of contact information of your neighbors. Um, for example, uh, emergency phone numbers, out of area uh, contact uh, phone numbers, emails, and know which of your neighbors may need uh, assistance uh, during or after a disaster. <clears throat> and then you want to, you know, ask your neighbors, what are their priorities? What do you want to work on as a neighborhood? Well, you may want to work on readiness for an earthquake or for a wildfire, become a neighborhood watch and so on. But that's kind of the, the gist of it uh, in terms of organizing your neighborhood. And uh, of course, you want to socialize uh, neighborhood parties, uh, national night out. Uh, as soon as we get through this uh, pandemic, we can do that again. <clears throat> and again, it's a great way to, to know you better know your neighbors and, and you know, again, uh, build a, a more, more of a community. We have these guides, as I noted, on our website, uh, OCP and our website. Our guide number one is called Neighborhood Organization. So uh, we really hope you take a look at that uh, and it provides more, you know, more detailed information about um, the, the steps that I just discussed. So let me talk about our guides and our web website for just a moment. This is our homepage on our website, oaklandcpnr.org, or you can just type in cpnr.org. And if you look at that tab across the top, excuse me, there's a tab called guides. That will take you to a page with our 22 uh, separate guides. We have those translated into Spanish. And if you click on each one, it's a two page front and back PDF file. You can view it online, you can download it, you can print it out. And if you'd even like printed copies, we can have those made for you. So the guides cover, as I said, number one, emergency, I'm sorry, neighborhood organization, uh, guide number two, notifications and so on. So there's a lot of information on there. And I also wanna point out on our homepage, there is a link to sign up for our e-newsletters. These come out uh, about once a week. Uh, and it's all about uh, disaster preparedness and response. There's a lot of good information on there. So if you go to our website or if you go to the Oakland uh, Fire Safe Council website, you'll see a similar link. Click on that and you can sign up for these uh, e-newsletters to come into your mailbox. Please do so. So it's moving on, uh, alerts and notifications, something that uh, you also need to understand, sign up for uh, in order to be prepared. The way we do that uh, in Oakland is through AC Alert primarily. So that's Alameda County Alert. AC Alerts delivers uh, emergency information and instructions to your home phone, your cell phone, <clears throat> or even email. So please go to acgov.org uh, and you will see a uh, link there to sign up for AC Alerts. If you don't do anything else uh, tonight, please do this, because that's how the county and the city, because uh, Oakland can send out AC Alerts as well, will notify you about uh, an emergency and what to do. 
There are also other ways to get notified. There are uh, what's called WIA, wireless emergency alerts. They come directly to your cell phone. You don't have to do anything. Uh, and the city of Oakland can send those out as well. And those can even be more targeted for uh, zip code. There's also Nixle is another online um, notification uh, service. Uh, Oakland Police uses that a little bit more. There are Twitter um, feeds that you can sign up for, for Oakland Fire, for, for Oakland Police and, and CAL FIRE and so on. And then there are applications, of course, like Nextdoor or Citizen that, that people can also get alerts. Another really good way to stay informed and to get emergency alerts is through uh, AM, FM radio. Remember those old transistor radios? Well, if you don't have one, uh, it's highly recommended that you get one battery powered radio. And uh, write on a piece of paper, tape it to the back. Uh, the station's 740 AM uh, and 88.5 FM. Those are emergency alert system radio stations and they will broadcast emergency alerts during a disaster, during and after disaster. So uh, radios are, are still a very useful way to get information. And should go without saying, but uh, follow all instructions that are provided in these alerts and, and by police, fire, or other emergency responders. Uh, watches, warnings, and orders. So I'm not going to go too much in detail about this, but there are basically two fire weather uh, warnings or notifications that come out. Uh, from the city of Oakland, from the Oakland Fire Department, from, from uh, Alameda County. And those are the fire weather watch, which means prepare for a wildfire. Conditions are such that within the next, I think it's 72 hours, uh, there could be um, uh, you know, the chance that a wildfire could occur. And then the red flag warning, which I'm sure we've all, all heard before. A red flag warning, I believe, is in the next 24 hours that conditions are such that the chance of a, of a fire is very high. And what that usually means is very low humidity, uh, wind, and uh, dry vegetation or fuel for a fire. So those red flag warnings, please take those seriously because, because those are times, and I, and I know they come out um, fairly often during the fall, uh, almost too often sometimes, but please uh, exercise extreme caution you know, don't barbecue outdoors and be ready. Be ready uh, because those, again, are signal, signaling that the conditions for wildfire uh, are extreme. There are also evac evacuation warnings and orders that may come from AC Alert, that may come directly from fire department or police. You have an evacuation warning, which means prepare. Then you have an evacuation order, which means leave right now. If you hear that order, uh, take heed. Uh, you may receive through AC Alert or here on the radio, shelter in place. That simply means stay put. Uh, you don't need to go anywhere right now. Uh, there are various reasons for that. Um, but again, heed that advice if, if you hear that. Finally, we have the emergency siren system in Oakland, 27 sirens, I think, uh, around the city of Oakland. Those go off uh, first Wednesday of the month at noon as a test. Uh, if you hear those uh, sirens go off, turn your radio on, uh, check your cell phone, check and see if you're getting any alerts. Uh, basically, that the sirens mean that something big is happening if it's not the monthly test. We do have a guide <clears throat> on this, guide number two, notifications and warnings. It goes into more detail about all of this. Uh, please take a look at that, um, download it, print it out, uh, and read it. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about disaster and evacuation plans. Uh, it's uh, very much recommended that everyone create a uh, disaster or evacuation plan. Things you would want to do uh, for that plan is to understand, for example, <clears throat> evacuation routes uh, out of your neighborhood in every direction uh, that you might be able to take because nobody can um, tell you, the fire department won't tell you, police won't tell you what your uh, absolute evacuation route always should be because nobody knows until uh, an event or disaster is actually taking place. You don't know where a uh, wildfire is coming from, what direction it's heading, 
You don't know if there are trees down, power lines down, blocking your, your exit routes and so on. So you should really know uh, every possible way out by foot, by car, et cetera. And also uh, take a look around your, your, uh, you know, your neighborhood in your area and locate any potential sheltering sites. If, for example, you can't uh, evacuate for, for any reason, a uh, potential sheltering site might be a school, you know, a large concrete building, uh, a large parking lot, a sports field, and so on. So just you know, take a look at the map and identify those. Uh, have your go bags and your stay box packed and ready to go. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, again, we said this already, know which neighbors may need help um, and have some plan to assist them. If it's your next door neighbor uh, has, for example, mobility uh, challenges, um, you know, work with them and let them know that you will be available to help them and as well as a couple of other neighbors uh, during and after a disaster. Have a checklist of items. This is part of your plan. Uh, you can't wait until you're told uh, you have 10 minutes to evacuate to try to think of everything you want to grab. So have this already written down, you know, the locations, what you're going to take, uh, and in a place that you can grab that checklist um, and act on it. Always have carriers and, and supplies ready if you have any pets. Uh, and you should, again, as part of your plan, designate meeting locations to reunite with uh, family members, both around your house and away from your residence. The reason for that is, uh, let's say, unfortunately, if your house were to catch fire, your family members, if this were to happen at night, for example, family members may go out different exits, different doors, different windows. How are you going to know who is out of the house and who isn't? Uh, unless you have a, a designated spot to meet up at, um, and then you can take count uh, and make sure that everybody made it out. And as, as well, you want to have an out of the area contact, uh, and that's a person who uh, is out of the area. Uh, everybody in your family has their contact information, phone number, uh, email, and if there is a disaster, if people are separated, if someone is at work, someone's at home, that's the person you're, everybody's going to contact to update them with your location and with your status. And then that person will act as a relay for other family members. So it's important that everybody knows these and, and uh, you know, this is written down as part of your plan. And then practice, practice, pra practice makes perfect, right? So practice uh, an evacuation out of your house, practice meeting somewhere uh, away from your home at your, um, you know, a site that you might reunite at. Uh, practice uh, grabbing um, items that you have on your list uh, if you had to evacuate. So we do have a guide. It's our guide number five, evacuation planning off our website. Please take a look. Okay, I'm gonna talk briefly about go bags. I'm sure everybody has heard of these. The um, purpose of a go bag is to uh, basically give you items that you may need for one or two days uh, that you could quickly grab, uh, for example, if you had to evacuate. Uh, here are some uh, possible items to have in your go bag. We uh, have you know, more on our website uh, and there are certainly a lot of other go bag lists out there. You can put these in a backpack. You can actually buy these pre-made uh, or you can make them yourself. Uh, and it doesn't even have to be a fancy backpack. It could just be a sturdy shopping bag or a duffel bag. And you wanna have go bags for your home. Uh, certainly, of course, uh, it's ideal to have smaller ones in your vehicles. And uh, if you have a separate workplace to have one there as well. At the same time, you should also consider creating your stay box uh, with more supplies, uh, extra food, water, maybe some camping supplies, uh, for example, a propane stove, sanitary supplies, and so on. And these would be in the same location that you keep your go bag. So everything's in one spot. You don't have to hunt around for it. And the purpose of the stay box is to allow you to survive, uh, let's say, up to a week or maybe a little more at your home if you're having a shelter in place or if you don't have to evacuate, if there has been, for example, an earthquake and you're not required to evacuate, then you do have all these uh, supplies. They're in one place. 
uh, and uh, they will allow you to um, subsist, you know, for a week or so at home. That's the stay box. We again have a guide, uh, go bag checklists, uh, and we have some stay box uh, suggested uh, items in our guide number seven. Power outages, public safety uh, power shutoffs from our friends at PG&E. Um, note that these PSPS uh, scheduled events typically occur on red flag warning days. That's because high wind, uh, PG&E you know, doesn't want branches or trees to come down on the wires and spark a fire when the humidity is low, the wind is high, uh, and the chance for a wildfire is extreme. Uh, I don't know if you were caught with the PSPS events, but certainly power outages can happen at any time. We recommend going to PG&E's website, sign up. They have, you can sign up for notifications, information. They've got a lot of good stuff on their website for preparedness and, and how to you know, respond uh, to power outages. Prepare for your own medical needs. If you have uh, refrigerated medicines or if you have medical devices that need power, um, call PG&E, tell them that, and they can work with you to come up with ways to power um, you know, your medical devices or refrigeration during a, a power outage, that's important. Uh, obviously keep your devices and, and backup batteries charged. <laughs> if you know a PSPS event has been uh, predicted, uh, charge everything up. Uh, if you have a garage door uh, and it has an electric uh, garage door opener, uh, know how to open your door manually. Uh, during the Oakland firestorm in, in 1991, uh, unfortunately, some people got caught out on that. The, the power went down uh, during the uh, firestorm. Uh, power lines were, were uh, you know, burned. And folks had forgotten how to flip that little um, tab on their uh, garage door opener uh, to open the door manually or insert a key and, and pull the tab. So make sure you know how to do that. And there are also battery backups for electric uh, garage door openers you may want to consider. There are other sources of, of power, of course. There are solar charged or um, uh, power line charged uh, large storage batteries that you can purchase that will may tide you over for a day or two, depending on uh, how you intend to use them. Or gas generators. Um, they, of course, have their pros and cons. Uh, we have a uh, guide on generators, on safety, um, but uh, the, those are two at least uh, alternative power supplies you can consider. Solar uh, panels, of course, with store, storage batteries would probably be the best option, but you know they're not inexpensive. And finally, with power outages, know that communications, uh, cell phone, internet, even landlines, those old fashioned um, copper landlines uh, are not guaranteed to work during extended power outages or certainly during a disaster. Uh, so keep that in mind, please uh, don't rely on your cell phone um, to keep you uh, safe uh, during or after disaster because again, it just may not work. We have a guide, our guide number eight on PSPS and um, power outages, please check that out. Okay, gonna talk a little bit about home hardening uh, against uh, earthquake and home hardening against wildfire. I'll start with earthquake. So really you want to uh, obviously minimize uh, hazards inside and outside your home uh, that a, an earthquake could exasperate. You hopefully don't want your home to look like uh, that one in the photo. So you want to secure your appliances, bookshelves, hot water heaters, uh, anything um, to the wall studs. Um, there are several ways to do that. There are hangers that, that are made just for that purpose. Uh, safety latches on cabinets, those can be very useful. In a strong earthquake, uh, those uh, kitchen cabinets, can doors can fly open, dishes can go uh, flying out and create a significant hazard in your kitchen. You want to ensure porches and decks are secured to the house so that those you know don't uh, detach. Um, have if you have a chimney, make sure it's uh, frequently cleaned and inspected. 
Uh, those chimney bricks are quite heavy and you wanna make sure that that chimney is uh, structurally sound. Uh, you wanna label your utility shutoffs, uh, mostly gas and electricity, and also water uh, outside um, and consider installing an auto seismic gas shutoff valve if you don't have one. Uh, I don't unfortunately have time to talk about that tonight. And there are again, pros and cons <laughs> with these gas shutoff valves that will automatically shut the gas off into your home uh, during a fairly large earthquake magnitude 5.3 or greater, I believe. Um, and the advantage to that is if you're not at home and you have uh, a gas line in your house that's cracked or broken or a, a large uh, appliance that shifts and breaks the gas line, no one's home to shut your gas off. Your, your home starts to fill up with gas. Um, that's not a good situation. So again, uh, but there are cons to the uh, gas shutoff valves as well. And lastly, uh, if you have a, ho a house that's you know more than 30 years old or so, you may wanna have it inspected by a contractor or an engineer certified in seismic work and consider recommended seismic upgrades, such as bolting the sill plates to the foundation, adding uh, bracing, uh, shear walls, and so on. Those are typically not inexpensive, but again, uh, a home is, <laughs> for a lot of people, um, certainly a very large investment. That's earthquake. Uh, we do have our guide number 10, Home Hardening on Earthquake. It has these tips and more. Please check that out. Okay, I'm going to shift a little bit to uh, wildfire and embers. I'm going to show a video here from the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety on ember danger. And there is no sound on this video, but uh, I'm going to narrate. <laughs> so this is inside a warehouse with an ember generator throwing embers to a mock-up of a, of a home. And you can see what's happening. There, there's dried vegetation, there's bark mulch right in front of the house. Those embers are starting uh, that material on fire. The fire is spreading. This house has wood siding, not too good, but uh, you can see the fire spreading there. This fire spreads to a wooden deck, fire spreads to a fence next to the house. The fence acts as a fire ladder all the way up into the roof. Uh, and then the house uh, becomes a blaze. So the point of that video is to help folks understand how um, insidious and how much of a danger uh, wind blown embers are. They, embers actually cause the most home fires during a wildfire. Uh, certainly uh, radiant heat and direct flame contact uh, will also ignite structures, but embers by far cause the most uh, home fires because they can be blown far uh, in advance of a wildfire or a firestorm, even miles in advance, large flaming embers, um, pieces of flaming uh, materials. And those again uh, can start homes on fire, uh, start spot fires and, and that's what happens. So how do you harden your home against that? Well. First, make sure that you have no combustibles uh, within that five foot space around your home. We call that zone zero, some call it zone one. Again, it's the five foot space. So no bark mulch, no dried leaves, no wood piles, no you know, things that are, are going to easily uh, ignite from embers and then transfer that flame to your home. It doesn't mean you can't have plants if the plants are you know, low uh, shrubbery, if they're green, kept watered, they don't dry out, you know, that's, that's okay. But again, it's, it's the dried fuels that you do not want around your home. You want to limb uh, tree branches up uh, from the ground that prevents, uh, you know, flames along the ground from working their way up into the crown of trees uh, where they can transfer to other trees. So limb your branches. Uh, you don't want overhanging limbs within 10 feet above the roof. Uh, vent screens. Um, there are a lot of vents on, on homes. There are eave vents. There are crawl space vents. There are vents for your uh, exhaust fan from your kitchen. You want to make sure that those are all covered with a mesh to prevent those embers from getting inside. And they can get inside. Small embers can get inside your home. 
they can catch your insulation on fire. They can, they can catch other combustibles in your home on fire that happens. You can cover those screens with a 1 8 inch metal mesh that you can purchase and cut and, and attach as in this photo. You can even buy uh, replacement vents that are purposely designed to not allow embers inside. They're a little bit more expensive, but they are effective. You want to make sure you don't have any flammables on or under porches or decks. Uh, fences, you should have, if you have a wood fence, you should do whatever you can uh, to have a non-combustible section uh, up against your house. So that may be brick, that could be metal as in this photo. Uh, I know that's a hard thing to do because some, you know, sometimes you uh, may need to take down part of your fence, but a wood fence, a uh, wooden fence, if it catches on fire, can transfer those flames again right up into your roof. Uh, class A rated roofs, those are actually per code. Uh, whether they're composite shingles or metal or tile are very good uh, in terms of being more fireproof. We just really don't want wood shake roof. Uh, and double pane windows, uh, again, not inexpensive, but they do keep heat out uh, and they are less apt to break during uh, flames, wildfire. And it goes without saying, but regularly clean your roof and your gutters because those dried leaves, again, if there are embers being blowed, uh, blown about in front of a fire, those embers can land in your gutters. Uh, the dried leaves can uh, ignite and flame. And then any of those that are up against the side of your house can transfer those flames you know, to, your, to your home. You don't want that. Guide number nine, home hardening for wildfire. Please check that out. I hear this a lot and, and I understand it. Uh, and I know you're, um, you know, you're in the hills or foothills, um, but I hear this from people, well, I don't live in the hills. I don't live in the wildland urban interface called the WUI. Uh, this isn't, you know, paradise. We don't have, we did have the Oakland firestorm, but uh, maybe I don't live in that area. So why should I be concerned about wildfire? Well, Sadly, this is uh, or was Coffee Park in Santa Rosa from the Tubbs Fire in 2017. Very tragic that Tubbs Fire was a wind-driven uh, firestorm. It blew across, um, I don't know, six, eight lanes of Highway 101 uh, into Santa Rosa. And you can see this is a completely flat neighborhood. Uh, it's not um, next to a park. Uh, and you can see what a wind-driven wildfire can do. So. Everyone in Oakland um, should be concerned and should prepare for uh, and harden their homes against the wildfire because it is, a, it is a threat. I wasn't here during the Oakland firestorm of 1991, but talking with firefighters who were, uh, they have said that if the Diablo winds, which uh, were driving that wildfire on that first day, if those had not died down, there's a good chance that that fire could have burned all the way to the bay, all the way through Oakland. Uh, once you have these, um, you know, wind-driven firestorms, there's not a lot the fire departments can do. I mean, they will do their best to fight it, but unless the winds die down or it rains or the wildfire just runs out of fuel, um, those are very difficult to, to stop. And, and, you know, that again, sadly, we've seen that um, more and more over the past few years, of course, uh, the campfire in paradise. Also, to keep in mind, uh, another reason you should be concerned about fire, uh, if and when there is a major earthquake, the earthquake will certainly cause a lot of fires, uh, gas uh, fires, electric related fires. This is a study from the USGS about the Hayward Fault. They are stating more than 400 uh, fires could ignite and, and 52,000 single family homes could burn. So um, again, if, if uh, you know, you should be worried about an earthquake, but uh, also concerned about fires that can result from an earthquake. Okay. Finally, uh, preparedness and response training. So you're getting a little bit of that this evening. Um, and if you look on our website, you'll get more information but we also encourage you to, uh, if you can, further your training for preparedness and response. 
There was an old program uh, called CORE, Communities of Oakland Respond to Emergencies. It was around for uh, 25 years. Uh, I'm sure some folks here have gone through the CORE training. CORE is now uh, been turned into an umbrella volunteer program with CERT emergency training, Community Emergency Response Team. It's a FEMA national program. That is now the new uh, disaster preparedness and response training for Oakland provided by Oakland Fire Department uh, Emergency Management Services Division. There's the link, you can sign up for CERT training. They just started it this uh, uh, in uh, February. Um, the first class uh, right now is going on. The next one I think will be around June, but please go to that link. You'll get more information and you can put your name on the list to take it. CERT training is the full curriculum, is about 22 hours, so, um, but you learn a lot. So again, highly encouraged. Okay, the second uh, section of the presentation tonight is responding during an emergency. So you wanna take action and be safe when something does happen. So what should you do if a major earthquake occurs? Well, drop cover and hold on until the shaking stops. Uh, afterwards, check yourself, check your family, check your home. You know, get outside if your home is damaged structurally in any way, please don't stay inside. Monitor your surroundings. Again, watch for fires, expect aftershocks, uh, and then help your neighbors. Uh, after you've helped yourself and your family, help your neighbors. <clears throat> and know that you may not necessarily need to evacuate from a, a, an earthquake uh, unless there are you know, fires or some other circumstance. Uh, certainly if you are ordered, uh, you will uh, need to evacuate. And if at any time you just don't feel safe uh, or you have the ability to, to get out and go uh, to a safer area, uh, please do so. Don't wait. What should you do if a wildfire approaches? If you see smoke, you hear uh, smell smoke, you see flames, you hear sirens, monitor your uh, AC alerts, your cell phones, monitor your AM, FM radio. If you have a two-way radio, uh, turn that on and then certainly monitor your surroundings. If you are ordered to evacuate, uh, do so. Uh, don't wait, don't stay. Don't be the person standing on the roof of that house trying to fight that fire with a garden hose because it's not gonna work. Uh, and again, if you feel unsafe at any time, uh, also just go. Uh, when in doubt, get out. Uh, help others in your neighborhood if possible as you're uh, leaving or as you're evacuating. Uh, and uh, in general, uh, during an evacuation, the experts say it's usually best to remain in your vehicle. Uh, vehicle will give you some protection from, from flames. Um, but uh, again, you also may want to look uh, for a refuge area if you are just totally trapped and you can't get out and you have uh, flames coming at you. It's a tough, uh, it'll be a tough circumstance. Evacuations, uh, again, follow all orders and instructions and follow your written plan. You have that evacuation plan. Monitor uh, for information, have your animals secured, uh, bring them with you if you have to evacuate. Don't leave them behind because you may not be able to go home for a while. Uh, when, uh, when evacuating, again, monitor your surroundings, uh, assist your neighbors. Take one vehicle or carpool, try to reduce uh, traffic, reduce congestion on the roads. Again, remember all your possible ways out because the most, you know, the most obvious way, obvious way uh, out of your neighborhood to a, a large major road or a highway, which is where you want to head. Um, the most obviously way will probably be your best way, but again, it may not, it may be blocked. So no uh, other ways that you can get out. Again, if all your escape routes are blocked and you have to uh, leave your vehicle, uh, look for a, a secure refuge area. Note that schools will protect children. That's when kids were in school, uh, but uh, schools will shelter children in place. Schools are generally pretty uh, hardened uh, and relatively fire safe areas. Uh, and this is probably easier than said than done but remain as calm as possible um, during an evacuation, during a disaster. Again, we have a guide, guide number six, emergency evacuations. 
I'm going to spend a few minutes on recovery. This is the third and the last section uh, of this workshop. So recovery after an emergency. So, so shoo, it, it's over. Uh, you want to be aware, you want to be helpful, and you want to be safe after a disaster. First thing uh, you want to do uh, when you can, obviously, first thing is breathe, uh, recompose yourself uh, and check yourself for physically uh, and emotionally as well. Um, you want to evaluate your family's health and well-being. So it's the order is generally yourself, your family, and then your neighbors. But you want to make sure everybody's accounted for, everybody's safe and secure. You wanna then check your home for unsafe conditions. If your home or your residence, if you're in an apartment looks like that, anything like that, please do not go inside. That is unsafe structurally. You want to uh, wear protective clothing. And this is not just after um, a disaster, but really you should have these, uh, this protective clothing you know, in your go bag or next to your go bag that you can also grab and put on uh, during uh, a disaster, for example, during um, an evacuation. So that includes um, you know, a bandana or a safety mask, you know, goggles certainly for eye protection, gloves, you know, long sleeve uh, shirt, uh, pants and heavy boots. Those are all designed to pr protect, uh, protect yourself from uh, a lot of different things that can injure you. So make sure you have those on certainly after disaster. And, and again, if you're having to evacuate, have, those hand, have these clothing items handy that you can grab and quickly put them on. Uh, note, uh, after disaster, don't consume any water, food, or medicines that have been exposed to fire or smoke. Uh, there are a lot of uh, very nasty chemicals uh, produced uh, in a home fire or wildfire. So you don't want to ingest any of those. Again, we have a guide. Please uh, take a look at that, read it. Uh, guide number four, um, family response during and after disaster. Finally, uh, assist your neighbors and then check in. So again, help your neighbors uh, as best as you can. Don't you know, put yourself in any danger. No uh, what you're able to do, what kind of training you may have or not have um, to help somebody, but um, you know, do the best you can to help your neighbors and likewise, they should do the best uh, they can to help you if it's needed. Check in, check in with your contacts after, uh, after the dust has settled. Uh, get in touch with your out of area contact, let them know where you are, what your status is, uh, and your other family members should do the same if they're if they're home or if they're at some other location. And then again, that out of area contact can relay everybody's location and status to everybody else in your family. Uh, note, uh, when you are making these contacts, uh, communications to your out of area contacts or to other family members, um, if you can, if you have cell service, uh, send te text messages instead of uh, making a phone call. Uh, a couple reasons for that. One is that text messages are more liable to get through uh, a very congested uh, cellular network as opposed to a, a phone call. And text messages, because of that, because of text messages uh, using much less bandwidth, uh, they're less likely to add to that congestion. Uh, and then another good uh, reason to use uh, texting when you're when you're communicating is that you have a written uh, record of what was said. So if someone was able to text you and they gave you the address of where they were, maybe a family member got stuck when they were out shopping when when something happened, you have that address, you have a written record of it, uh, and you you are you know not liable to forget it uh, if they had told that to you over the phone. Uh, finally, you know, at some point you may want to post your status on social media so that others uh, know how you're doing, where you are, and so on. Uh, note that after disaster, the City of Oakland and the American Red Cross may need to open shelters. Um, you will be informed if you have to go to a shelter, if you're unable to stay in your house um, for whatever reason, or if you've had to evacuate. 
um, you will be informed of where those shelters are through AC Alert, through a, you know, through radio broadcasts, and through other communications that uh, first responders will provide to know where those shelters are uh, and where to go. Last but not least, at some point after a disaster, you probably should notify your insurance company. Now, you're not going to file a claim, most likely anytime soon, but at least uh, they know uh, your situation and you're in the queue. We do have a guide on home insurance. Please check that out. Number 11 has a lot of tips about an uh, in ensuring that you have adequate insurance for uh, all your, um, you know, all your possessions, your home, questions to ask your insurance agent to make sure you're you're protected, uh, and a lot of other information on on home insurance uh, regarding uh, disaster. Okay, wrapping up. Uh, next steps. Um, these are things that we really uh, highly suggest that you work on um, going forward. First and foremost, if you haven't yet, please register for AC Alert. Again, uh, it'd be fantastic if everybody uh, were registered and could get those alerts because they are very important. If you're in a neighborhood that's not too organized or maybe it was organized at some point, it's kind of fallen by the wayside, um, you should work on that with your neighbors. Now, that's not something you can do overnight, uh, but it is, again, important. And it's something that we uh, highly recommend uh, folks uh, be part of an organized neighborhood and work with their neighbors and know their neighbors. Uh, create your evacuation plan and practice it. Again, refer to our guide uh, on how to do that. Um, create your go bags if you don't have them, your stay box, um, you know, get your supplies. Uh, it's not something you have to do again overnight, um, but little by little you can start to build those um, uh, go bags and stay box. Prepare for power outages as we've outlined and, and that are on our website. And then take the steps um, to harden your home against earthquake and wildfire, knowing that you know, some of those steps uh, are very easy and very inexpensive. Um, other steps may be, you know, more time consuming or more expensive. So you just have to pick and choose which ones you can do. Uh, now actually is a great time to start preparing for next wildfire season. Uh, wildfire season in California, sadly, now is almost a year around, uh, year round season. Um, but certainly during the you know, rainy time, it, it's good um, to start thinking about what you wanna to do to prepare for the height of the wild season, which is summer and fall. And then again, take additional training, CERT training if you can, um, highly recommended. So please, those are your next steps. And we have a checklist. If you look on our website, uh, there's a tab that says prepare now. At the very top, there's a one page checklist you can download and then you can just tick these items off as you make their, your way through the list uh, and become better prepared. Again, prepare before disaster occurs. Final thoughts. Um, this is the last slide. Uh, I see it's just about eight, there it is eight o'clock, so good. Uh, take these preparedness steps one at a time. I know it can seem overwhelming. Uh, it's a lot of information packed in the last hour. Sorry for talking so quickly. Um, if it feels overwhelming, just break uh, these uh, actions down one at a time. Make a small step. Um, you know, start thinking about your uh, disaster plan or your evacuation plan. Start writing things down. Um, and anything you do, remember, you're better off than before. So hopefully, even uh, from an hour ago, you're better off. You have more knowledge. You, you know things that you can be working on. Uh, review the guides on our website. There are a lot of other great sources of information, including Listos, California, uh, FEMA's ready.gov, where you can find uh, similar information. Um, PG&E, we've already noted. Again, if your friends and neighbors haven't prepared, please encourage them to do so. Uh, and reach out to us with any questions at any time. Here is our contact information. Uh, the email is best. 
and then again, there are our website addresses for our Oakland CPR program and the Fire Safe Council. Um, okay. I'm done talking. <laughs> Wow. Thank you, everyone, for, for sticking around. I'm going to stop my share. Again, I'm going to make this presentation available to Carla so she can uh, get that out to you. Um, and I thank everyone for sticking around for this hour. This is fantastic. Oh, one last thing. And I see a colleague here. Hi, Jen. Um, can I put you on the spot to talk about the Savvy Senior Series? So this is just a couple minute on uh, Oakland Fire Safe Council offering coming up. Sure, no problem. Hey everybody, thanks for coming tonight. Um, Doug, I just wanted you to, to check out the chat. Um, there's a question for you, a couple questions that you might wanna answer after I do this little promo. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so we have this, um, series, a town hall series called the, the Savvy Homeowner and Renters 2 um, in our disaster prone community. And um, coming up, we, are, we have session three this month, which is all about defensible space. And that will be on March 25th um, from 5.30 to 7.00 um, at night. I will put the information in the chat. And this All About Defensible Space will be showing a video presentation by Vince Crudelli. Is that the way you pronounce it, Doug? Mm -hmm. uh, Vince Crudelli of the Oakland Fire Department. And it's a primer on compliance with Oakland's annual fire inspection. And then after that video presentation, Travis Hansen, who is the acting supervisor of OFD Vegetation Management Unit, will be... Um, our guest speaker, and he'll be talking about Oakland's annual fire inspection, a summary of 2020 inspections and what to expect in 2021. Thank and you, that. Jen. And, and also to note, thank you, Jen, that's, that's yeah. perfect. And also to note, there are two follow-on sessions, um, one in April, one in May. The one in uh, April is about earthquakes. Um, more information, preparedness information uh, regarding an earthquake. And the one in May is on insurance, home insurance. And there was uh, a question. To disaster. So there was a question. I see that there's actually a question, recommendation. So uh, I can take questions now. I can, I can go through these um, questions here in chat if anyone else has any questions. Uh, if you want to take off, please. Um, uh, um. Let me throw oh, one ahead, thing Carla. before you all jump off, um, is that we do have another event on um, March 18th. It is Advancing um, Racial Equity in Oakland. And so we have Darlene Flynn, who is the Executive Director of the Department of Race and Equity in Oakland. And, and she, she's pretty hard to get, so we were pretty very pleased that she will be joining us. Um, I, if you were on Eventbrite, you might've got a notification of it, but I'm gonna send out promo on that um, probably tomorrow. Um, so at 6.30 on the 18th. So I just wanted to say that before people hopped off. Um, Doug, there was a question about, does it make sense to spend money on some kind of chimney check, even if you don't use your fireplace? Um, in terms of uh, fire safety, if it's not being used or you have it capped off, especially, uh, you certainly don't need to have it cleaned, but structurally, um, it's not a bad idea, at least, you know, if you can, to have someone look at the chimney from a structural point of view, um, make sure all those bricks are still well uh, cemented together. And, uh, you know, again, there's a lot of weight in a chimney and during an earthquake, those can fall down and cause a lot of damage. Great. Does anybody have any questions they just want to ask? Unmute yourself, obviously. All right. I, I have something else to plug on yeah. behalf of the city of Oakland, if anybody else, uh, if nobody else wants to say anything. All right, go for it. Okay. Um, the city of Oakland is also holding town halls, virtual town halls about disaster preparedness. And um, 
they're talking about the local hazard mitigation plan and the reactivated SERP program that Doug had touched on in his presentation. And then also just general preparedness. And they're really trying to reach all uh, Oakland communities. And it's a little bit of a challenge, um, but uh, so we're just trying to get the, the word out there to as many people, Oakland residents, because it um, disasters affect everybody in Oakland. So I'm gonna throw up that information as well. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. And my bad, I, I didn't introduce Jen very well. Jen is on the Oakland Fire Safe Council, uh, has worked uh, on the OCPNR program since day one, and uh, is works on marketing outreach, produces the fantastic e-newsletters that go out, um, and just does uh, a lot of great work um, in creating our OCPNR program. Thank you, Jen. Um, one other thing from the association, I, I see Gretchen, so. Um, <laughs> The uh, EB Mud uh, follow up is April twentieth. I think it is. Um, I will confirm, but I'm fairly sure it's April twentieth. Um, so yes, so that is scheduled. So just so you know, um, I know that that bunch of folks are are looking for that. <laughs> All right. Is that anything but else? I did see a question about earthquake insurance. Um, yeah, that's a, a, a topic that comes up. And, and um, again, our uh, savvy series from the Fire Safe Council, the one in, in May, will be about insurance. Um, and the link that was provided by Jen, uh, UP Help, uh, is a good resource to, to check out um, United Policyholders. They're a nonprofit. It sounds like an insurance company. They're not. They don't sell you anything. They help you with insurance. Uh, matters around home home insurance. So it's a good it's a good resource to take a look at. Great. Looks like there's another question. Um, fire and smoke hazard. Is there any info recommendations alert systems? Um, which level of filtration to consider with purple air versus air now? Any etc. Any other choices? Yeah, I'm trying to find that. <clears throat> um, oh, here we go. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. There was actually a, on TV5 uh, on Friday, there was a segment on um, a hazard, probably you saw that, uh, about wildfire smoke. So it certainly is a hazard. We haven't really addressed um, filtration units um, in OCPNR yet. Um, and I don't really have a lot of good information on it, but uh, if that's something uh, someone people are interested in, we could do some of that research and provide you uh, with more information. Certainly there are a lot of uh, sensors out there like Purple Air or, or others that will measure uh, particulates in the, in the air and smoke and, and you can see what it is around your area from others. Um, but yeah, it's something to certainly smoke particulates are, are uh, very hazardous to one's health. Uh, and you want to pay special attention to protecting yourself from them. Great, thank you. All right, anybody else? Either chime in or chat. <laughs> if not, we will wrap this up. Any questions? You know what, you covered so much material that I know I have so much work to do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm lo really looking forward to getting this um, presentation because it will help everybody and the checklists, you know, I love that the checklists go with the different pieces. So um, I hope everybody found this really helpful. Doug, thank you so very much. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're uh, welcome. Thank you everyone for, for uh, spending the time this evening. Yeah, and, and we're, oh, Jen, thanks for uh, ma managing the chat. That was a great surprise. <laughs> So, all right. Thank you so much. Everybody stay safe and um, we'll hopefully we'll see you soon. Yeah, thank you. Any questions, you. let us know. Thank you. Sign up for our newsletter. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Doug. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you, Carla, for organizing this and absolutely setting everything up. Very much appreciated. Doug, this is really terrific. Thank you so much. Yeah. So. Welcome. All right, folks. Good night. Good night. See you soon.